Howard Jones, singer, songwriter, pop superstar. Thank you so much for being part of Three Questions. Well, thanks very much for inviting me. I'm pleased to be here, Bob. You have millions of fans around the world. You tour all over the place. And yet, here you are in Park City, mm. five nights at the Egyptian, mm. sold out every single night. Mm. What is it with you and these Park City audiences? Um, that's a really good question. And I think it goes right back to the early 80s when I played Park West and those incredible summer nights, you know, oh with yes. everyone streaming up the mountain to get a good place early. And I could see them from, from my dressing room. And then, um, and then going out there and seeing thousands and thousands of people just, you know, going up the mountain and the beautiful scenery. And I think we formed a, a real connection during that that time and I, th I don't think it's gone away I think it was it was cemented you know on, uh, in those early early shows now you've sold out five nights running here at the Egyptian theater in Park City um, but you're here a lot more than just for the show I mean you've got a lot of downtime what do you do when you're not here on stage um, well you know for me uh, being on tour it's it, it's quite a a disciplined thing because I need to keep myself fit and well and healthy because I can't do two hours of singing and playing and thinking <laughs> thinking mm -hmm. straight if I'm not so really you know I do like today I did an hour and a half of Pilates in my room went for a walk you know got some really good uh, vegan food <laughs> and uh, and emails keeping up with Twitter keeping up with people are saying so basically it's all the time is taken. Um, but have you have you skied at all? I mean, you're, you're here in Park <laughs> City. No, I, I I would love. I would. I actually part of my youth was in Canada, where there's plenty of snow, uh -huh. and I used to do the single board thing going S down. Snowboard? Yeah, it was a snowboard. It was the, it was the be early before they got good and high tech. I see. It was a very primitive snowboard. And I used to love that, absolutely loved it. And I loved, s I love ice skating as well. Mm. But uh, <laughs> they, they won't insure me to do dangerous sports, when I <laughs> you know, so uh, <laughs> I can't really do it. Um. You can, w <laughs> you, it's kind of like building the mansion but not moving in. <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's right. That's <laughs> to coin a phrase. I know, yeah. I, I, um, I'm always terrified of also damaging my fingers, you know, because like if yeah. I can't play, it's like, taken yeah but it's arm. all recorded you could just play the recording and sing yeah you know? no i you wouldn't know, be I'd quite the same no no yeah so much of your material has such a positive message to it yeah. i mean you know i i'm thinking of everlasting love and things can only get better yeah do you hear from fans and what is it like when you hear from fans who say howard this song lifted me so much what does that do inside your heart well it, it's it's wonderful to to have that response and because i did set out to do that you know i i set out to have lyrics and songs combined that were like sort of cheerleading events mm. you know because uh, so much of life you know is difficult and there's difficult problems to solve sometimes it seems like it's impossible to go forward and music and art in, in general can be, uh, you know, give you a, an incredible boost and, and get just get you over that little ridge into the valley and you're, you're sailing again, you know what I mean? And I think that music and lyrics can really provide that and that's what I wanted to do with, with my work. And that's what, um, why I'm so excited when people respond in that way, you know, they, 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 they say, you know, this did, this did help and great, that's my job, that's my job. Mm. Yeah. When, when you mention the stories of people, fans who have heard your music and have had such a positive uh, experience with it and been lifted by it, do any particular stories come to mind? Um, that yeah, there's, well, uh, on the last tour that I did in the UK, I actually asked the fans to email me and say which songs they would like me to play and what gig they were going to be at. So I knew they would be in the audience. And I got the most, inc so, some of those emails were just, well, I mean, heartbreakingly brilliant, you know. Mm. And there was one particular one 
I was in, I was in Wales, and it was from a, a parent who'd, who'd said that um, his daughter had been involved in a terrible car accident just before her big exams, and we call them A-levels in the UK. And she was really down and, and struggling to recover, and he played her, Things Can Only Get Better. And it became her like theme song, and, yeah. and, it, and it really helped to get through the, the you know the recovery, and um, and then she uh, she did really well with her exams, and uh, so I read the story out, <laughs> right, and the whole audience like was cheering, oh. you know, they, like they really got behind, and that happened countless times during that tour, um, so yeah, it, it was uh, you know that that's that's totally what makes it worthwhile for me. You know, that's what um, that's why why that's my function. You're considered one of the pioneers of electronic music. I mean, yeah. you were using synthesizers before synthesizers were cool, you know, and drum <laughs> machines and, and sequencers yeah. and sampling and all that kind of mm. thing. Was that difficult back in those yeah. days when you were kind of the tip of the spear of that uh, genre? I, I, I think so. I think so. When you're, on a, when you're a pioneer of something, you always come up against so much opposition, you know, because people have a natural resistance to change. Personally, I, I embrace it, but I think it was, one, uh, it was a crucial thing for me because the opposition that I had trying to introduce these new instruments, synthesizers, drum machines, you know, uh, that, that opposition um, really forged my character so that I, I, I wasn't susceptible to criticism and people having a go. I was kind of used to it. So I, I, I had to become confident of my own decisions and my own way of doing things, and that's really stood me in good stead. So I, I can only look back on it as, be, you know, it was difficult, but great, you know, at the same time. When you look back on those pioneering days of the electronic music genre, and you were really the tip of the spear th back then, it takes a great amount of confidence to be able to continue forward in something that nobody else is doing. Where did that confidence come from in you? I honestly don't know. I don't know because um, I think it was there from an, from an early age and it wasn't really, you know, I, I, I'm not really a, a particularly egocentric person and I don't like to make a fuss about, you know, about stuff. But there's something under the bonnet that is quite stable and like, no, you know, there's only one of you. You know, every single person is unique. Um, be confident with that. You know, just do things your way and to the best of your capacity. Do good things, you know. Make sure you create value. Um, and I, I just, I always, <laughs> I, don't know, <laughs> I don't know where it came from. Maybe, obviously from my parents and, and, you know, they did instill that into me somehow. But, um, but it's, like, it's, it's like difference between... It's confidence, but not arrogance. When it tips over into arrogance, that's kind of ugly, I always find. Um, and, and, it's, um, and, it, and it's not attractive. And um, thinking that one is better than other people, that's arrogance. And confidence is, I'm me. I'm great as me, you know. And yes. um, I, I think that fine line, you know, you've got to tread that carefully. Looking back at your early developing years as a musician and as an artist and a songwriter, who do you count as the most influential artists in your early years? Well, my mother was a, a big fan of listening to the radio. She, she um, was always, always had the radio on. So I was hearing the Beatles and all the bands from the 60s, uh, Liverpool band, you know, Freddie and the Dreamers, the Stones, Tremolos, all those. Um, but it was the Beatles that really stuck, st struck a chord with me. And then once, uh, you know, I got into music in such a big way, it was like bands with horn sections and funky things like uh, Blood, Sweat and Tears I loved and um, Stevie Wonder and Herbie Hancock's oh sort yeah. of jazz funk era. Um, and then got into prog rock and Keith Emerson was my big hero because he was a keyboard player who, who was a front man and he, he, he was like the Jimi Hendrix of the keyboards. Yeah. So yeah, so it was a real wide variety and at the same time I was studying classical music the whole time. So I had all that input of 
Bach and Beethoven and Brahms and you know the um, uh, Bartok and you know mm, yeah. you know I mean I, I so I it was had a m input from coming at me from everywhere and then you end up with this sort of broad <laughs> broad palette of stuff that you've got to play with. As a classical musician, you were trained classically on the piano, yeah, correct? Yeah, yeah. As a classical pianist, mm. how does that inform your music even to this day? I'll, well, I think, well, for a start, it gave me a great facility with my actual physical m ability to play. Uh, but then it, it's a whole set of um, harmonic values that you get from it. You know, right from, well, from Bach, you know, uh, as it progresses through the centuries, it becomes more and more complex and atonal and you know you, it brings in more more colors um, but it, it gives you a sense of what um, of, of the relationship of, of its harmonic uh, education really that's what I think of it as yeah w what do you think of pop music today um, I think there's a lot of good things still going on out there um, I think it's harder to find it you, um, you, you know, you have to kind of do your own research. You have to look for bands, new bands. And I, um, I still find artists that I really, really love. Um, Can you name things. a few? Yeah, there's uh, an artist called uh, Laura Marling, who's like a, uh, an English contemporary folk artist. And she's amazing, amazing singer. And um, I'm just trying to think now. So I, I, I do have a, a list of people. <laughs> <laughs> a list of people that I, I <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you, Bob, for asking <laughs> yeah. that question. And I, um, I have them on the tip of my tongue. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I suppose that actually I'm more drawn to listening to artists that I've grown grown up with and what their contemporary work is. Like my favorite album at the moment is um, Alison Moyet's new album, which is really exceptional. And then I'm listening to Ella Fitzgerald, a recording that was done with the London Symphony Orchestra. They used the, her original recordings and put new contemporary arrangements wow. to it. So it's, it's absolutely exquisite, you know. So it's probably in, in the Spotify era, you know, the streaming era, you sort of go on these journeys to listen to very diverse things. It's harder to find n new artists. And I think that's something that as an industry we need to deal with. And we need to make sure they get enough income from it that they can sustain themselves and not be part-time, because that's, that's a problem. And, and I want to address that right now. Yeah. The, the music industry anymore, the business model for it has changed so dramatically mm -hmm. that, I mean, we're, we're not seeing as many artists, I don't think, I don't know. It used to be in the day, you, you know, you go out and buy the album and people line up at the record stores and they pay their money. Now we're in this streaming world mm -hmm where you know you can download and for 10 bucks a month you can have all the music you can eat mm -hmm. how do artists such as yourself and the others that are in the music industry make any money well yeah i mean it is it is an issue and i think until more people subscribe you know to a 10 to dollar a month thing um, uh, that that's what we need because there's actually very few people who do that um, <laughs> I think it all stems back to, uh, you know, a huge advance in technology. You know, digital technology. The music business was the was the was the the front end of, of, of all that. I think all the other industries have learnt from what happened to music, um, but we had to take the hit. You know, so basically, there's a whole generation of people who grew up thinking that music should be free and 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 that you know it's like water, it's like air. And who can, you know, that's the culture that they grew up with, and that's, that's fair enough. But um, as we know, if you want to sustain people making a living from music, which you have to, then they're going to need to have an income that so they can be out there playing and making records for you. So um, I, I, I don't quite, I think it's still, everything's still up in the air at the moment. I things haven't settled down, but I hope that in the next 10 years, it will get much better for artists. See, what I think will happen is that there will be a system whereby if you make a piece of, of work, a piece of music, you or, or me, anyone, 
it'll have a, a, a digital signature to it um, and that as soon as anybody consumes it in any way you will know and you can say yes or no you can decide how much you want to charge and it will be all in the power of the creator and I think we have the, the technology exists to do that we just need to get it going you know um, and, and you know it's the um, I can't remember what it's called now the oh, I always forget the name of it it's, 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 it's um, a new technology that links all computers around around the world so that you can't you can't hack it you know, so it's all documented in multiple places. Hmm. So that it's so it's not the internet, is it? That you're no, about? no, no. This is it, it's called uh, blockchain. Oh yes, blockchain. blockchain. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And blockchain. Bitcoin is connected to all of that. And yeah, yeah. Digital yeah. currencies and, and things. Yeah. You've stripped down your live show. I mean, you in years have in years past you have toured with full bands and had all these synthesizers around you. Yeah. Now it's just you and a keyboard yeah, and a stage and a microphone. Yeah, it's simple. Which do you prefer? Well, I mean, you know, in the summer we were at Red Butte and it, I was with my full, full band, mm -hmm. you know. And so people, people know that, that there's that. The two things run in parallel for me, you know. It's like this is the intimate... I don't even have to worry about the technology with this. The piano just switches on. <laughs> it sounds good. As long as there's, there's electricity. You know, the <laughs> thing is about the band, it's like <laughs> there's masses of technology that all has to work, and sometimes it doesn't. And yeah. there's always a sort of underlying anxiety that, you, as an electronic musician, you, you have, right? You're going to yeah. have. But, um, but this is like I can just concentrate on the songs, the singing, the playing, tell the stories. It's like really simple, but you have to be... 100% focus the whole time. Yeah. There's no off time when you're there. <laughs> and it's more intimate, is it not? Is it's that more enjoyable intimate. for you? Um, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, when I'm doing it like I am at the moment, I'm thinking this is the best. You know, I, I only want to do this. Forget the band. <laughs> I just want to <laughs> do this. And the band's <laughs> going, wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> then wh when I'm playing with the band, that's so brilliant and it's such fun and it's a big sound and everyone's dancing and you know it's a different vibe so I love that as well so I'm completely inconsistent really with that. You don't find many artists who are able to do it all I mean from the songwriting to the performing to the recording to you know and crossing between a full band sound and a live intimate solo sound what is the key to being able to operate in that arena? Um, I mean, one thing is, is I've always valued um, independence, you know, as an artist. I don't really like somebody controlling behind the scenes what's going on. For me, it's like very important to be in charge of your destiny. And I think that's what made me um, become very, um, you know, wanting to, to be able to fill in the gaps in what I can do, you know. So I wanted to learn how to w record in the studio, and record vocals and record brass sections and um, as well as play live and as well as understand the technology that you need to get a great sound. I just, I, I guess, you know, I, I wanted to be independent and also I'm curious about how far you can take something and do something that nobody's done before, you know, tried new things and um, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't and you take it on the chin, you know. Yeah. Mm. Artists such as yourself who've been around for a long, long time and have been touring for a long, long time who have had many hits wind up playing those hits mm. over and over and yeah. over yeah. and over, <laughs> night after night, year after year. How do you keep it fresh for the folks who may not have seen you? That's right. You for never, never heard it yeah, really so how, yeah. how do you keep that fresh? That's really, it's, that's, that's the struggle, I think. That's the really important thing because it's got to be fresh for you and fresh for them. For, for a start, when you play a song that people know and they respond, there's no better feeling as a songwriter. So you're already in, great, in a great place. Uh, and if it was, I could just leave it at that. You know, people knowing your songs and singing along with you, how good is that? I mean, for any artist. Doesn't get better. Doesn't get better than that. And when you've got like a, a, a whole evening of them, that's incredible. 
but, but I think for me, um, I always try and find a different way, different twist to the, s to the song. Sometimes take it in another direction, you know, um, in the middle, go for a walk with some other musical genre in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. I always find a different way to sing it slightly different, but not too different, you know, because people get annoyed sure. with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and then, yeah, and then like, like things like, you know, things can only get better. I throw in like a salsa um, section. You know, because that's fun for me to do. Breaks it up and then... A solo you know, salsa section. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's great. And then, you know, then I do... Yeah, so it, it you just find ways to keep it interesting for yourself so that it, the energy is strong when it comes when it goes out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in the 80s, your song, uh, Like to Get to Know You Well, uh, got released in Japan. Yeah. But <laughs> there was a yeah. problem. Yes. Tell me yeah. what that problem well, was. Well, you know, the problem was, um, you know, the translation we'd had done for the cover, which was, I'd like to get to know you well in Japanese, you know, turned out to be, I'd like to force myself upon you, you know. Um, <laughs> it's like the complete opposite <laughs> of what the song, I, 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 gotta, I can't even say that <laughs> very easily. Um, and, but it's a true story, and the, r the record company just, didn't want me to release it at all. They 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 would they thought it would ruin my career, which it probably would have. And uh, well, in Japan. So it did not get released then. No, it didn't. It didn't get released. They we fixed it. <laughs> we fixed it, but it was a, um, an, a, a sort of a, a literal translation of I'd like to get to know you well that had been done, and in, and you know it needed much more finesse in the <laughs> translation. <laughs> did you ever find <laughs> out who ones. translated the first version? No, I don't know. I, I was that was not my uh, my department. I just asked. I, it was my idea to do it, but. I don't know who they got to do it. Mm. <laughs> well, as, as we wind up here, uh, first of all, thank you for doing this, but uh, you've got a new album that you're working on. Yeah, yeah. In light of streaming technologies now and the fact that people aren't going out and buying 15 songs at a time anymore, um, how does that affect the way you produce this album? <laughs> That's a really good, good question. I mean, I... I just, I think you've got to think really differently. Um, for instance, what I'm doing is I'm playing some of the songs l now to them before that it's even available, and before I've even recorded it the way I want to. So if s you know, people get to hear it in its raw form. I've been writing quite a few songs for films, so that's a thread that people will see in the, in the th movie theater and they'll hear it there and then they can you know, it's connecting, it's, it's like trying to be more connecting of, of all, all different things. Um, but um, it's more, more of a collection of songs that I can fit in, in, in between my live work, really. Um, and I think, as you say, it, there's not that hunger and thirst for a new album for most artists, really. So you've got to think carefully, how much time you're going to put into that? And, and you know, if you're going to take a year out of your life, then maybe that's just too much now, you know, maybe you should just make it a bit more quickly. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> that's, I haven't got a solution to that one. Well, Howard Jones, singer, songwriter, recording artist, pop superstar, thank you so much Thanks, Bob. for being part of Three Questions. Enjoyed it very much, thank you. Thanks.